By the way, if you're asking, hey, where's Pastor Kevin? I bet you never thought you would hear this at church. I'm pretty sure our pastor is fishing today. What's up with that, right? Yeah, no, he's going to have a great time. And I know that I know he's going to watch this and listen to it at some point. So why don't you say hi to Pastor Kevin? That's awesome. All right. That's right. We just made his day. And while the cat's away, the mice will play. So here we go. All right. We're going to have some fun. Um, we're in the middle of a series called Belong, Believe, and Behave. And uh, I taught a couple of things last week. First of all, uh, these are three things that every church has to address in some form. I mean, what kind of a church would not teach you what to believe? I mean, that's sort of what churches do. What kind of a church would not teach you some form of behavior? Because if a church never addressed the way that you lived, you would say, why would I go to that church? Because churches should actually bring out the best in us and teach us how to behave in ways that keep us from hurting each other and that actually teach us how to partner with each other. And what kind of a church would not give you any sense of belonging? So all three of these are really important. And, and, and what I taught last week is whichever one we put first creates the dominant culture in our church. And the interesting thing is I've got belong on the top because that's where Jesus put it. But the interesting thing about belong is if you put it anywhere but first, then it creates sort of a gated community model of a church. Because when people come to church, if the first thing that they feel is not a sense of belonging, if the first thing they feel is that people are looking at their behavior or people are looking at their belief system and judging them based on their behavior and judging them based upon what their belief system is, then it forms this natural barrier between the church and that person. Yeah, it, I call it the gated community sort of thing. And that is, if you pass our belief test and you pass our behavior test, we'll let you in. But if you don't pass either one of those, the gates are going to go down and you're not going to be in because you don't have the code to get in because you don't pass our test. That's a terrible model for a church, and yet it's the most natural model for the human spirit. Because when we come to a church and we love the church, we don't want anything to spoil the church. And we realize that the only people that could spoil the church are those people. So we better be very careful about who we let in. Does that make sense to anybody? That's the most natural thing for us to do. It's just wrong. Okay? So we're going to talk about that. That's not how Jesus did it. And that's not how we do it as a church. And this, again, is the thing I so love about every single one of you. And I feel so blessed to get to walk through life with you because together we are learning how to live life the way that Jesus lived it. And so today, we're going to walk through what this sense of belonging is and we're going to answer the question, do I belong? And we'll actually tweak that question just a little bit. But before we jump into that, I realize it's important for us to know what belonging actually means. And wrapped up in that, that word belonging and that, that, that phrase, sense of belonging, are actually three major components. So let's take a look at what those components might be. The first principle that's wrapped up in the sense of belonging is that I am being seen. Not that somebody can see that there's a physical body standing there, but that I am being seen not, for, not just for what I represent or not just for what I have done or am doing, but that you actually see me. And you'd be amazed at how often we go through life and people don't actually see us and we don't actually see the people in our world. I've been having fun with this over the last, I don't know, six or eight weeks when, when this thing first got on my radar to realize that when I go to a grocery store, more often than not, the person who checks me out actually doesn't feel seen. They're just there to scan my items, take my money, ask me if I found everything I wanted, and send me on my way. So I made a habit now. It's a pattern in my life. I actually read their name tag. And somewhere in my interaction with them, I'm going to call them by their name. Because there's something very human in calling someone by their name. 
And I've also made it a, a pattern to ask them, hey, how are you doing? I, I can't tell you how many of them have stopped scanning my stuff and they look right at me and they say, hey, thanks for asking. You know what? For the first time in our interchange, they realize I have actually seen them. And they're now ready to actually see me. So that's the first thing in this sense of belonging is we have to feel actually seen and valued as a person, not just what we represent. So how does that translate at church? When you come to church, I don't ever want you to see yourself as just a member of the church and one of the crowd. I want to make sure that when you come to church that you feel seen. Yeah. The second principle that's in this is that we have to be included as equals. In other words, I'm treated as a peer. And for this principle, I want you to think about the concept of leveling the ground. Because when people visit a church or when people interact with us, we have this little thing on the inside of us that continually measures, are these people above or beneath me? Do they think I came from the right side of the tracks or the wrong side of the tracks? For that matter, do I think they came from the right side of the tracks or the wrong side of the tracks? And, and what, what we're, we're continually doing is we've got that meter on and it's continually measuring is the ground level slanted in my favor or slanted against me? And without realizing it, we subconsciously choose our behavior based upon which way we think the ground is slanted. Now, if you could step with me out of our lives for a minute and step with me into the life of Jesus, who is the Son of God. He is God in human flesh. If there was ever a time when the ground was always slanted in his, in his direction, it would be when he came to earth, right? So there's not a single person who walks the face of planet earth that could walk into the presence of Jesus and feel like his equal because, frankly, no one was. And yet... In the most amazing way, Jesus actually leveled the ground and made everyone feel like they were welcome in his presence, not in a condescending way, not in a I feel sorry for you way, but in a way that says in, at some point you and I have common ground. We are alike. We are human beings. I see you, and I walk the same paths that you walk, and I experience the same things that you experience. It's amazing. Treated as a peer. I want to challenge all of us to learn how to read that level meter thing that we got going on inside of us, and to continually learn how to level the ground. In fact, I'll tell you something we do with our kids. And you'll think, oh, are you kidding? Does that really work? Yes, it does. Okay. So when our kids were teenagers, we actually wanted to talk with our kids about the most important things of life. And we realized that one of the most um, open times in a teenager's life was when they were laying in their bed. So instead of going and checking on them, are you in bed? Yep, okay. No reading right, turn the lights out, you need your sleep, you got to go to school tomorrow. Does that sound familiar to anybody? Yeah, thank you. <laughs> so what we would do, it, and it sounds crazy, but Monica and I, when we told the kids goodnight, often we would go in and lay on the floor beside their bed. You know why we laid on the floor? because we wanted them to feel above us. And then we just talked. I can guarantee you, if we had stood over them and said, hey, let's talk, we would have got nothing. Right? What do we do? We tilted the ground in their favor. Yeah. It's an amazing principle. Jesus was so good at it. We're going to see that. Here's the third principle, and that is this. 
there has to be some sense of feeling safe. And what I mean by feeling safe is this, that I can be fully me. When I say fully me, I don't just mean unveiling all my personality, although it does mean that. But what it means is I, I don't actually have to hide any part of me. My, even my deepest, darkest secrets and my point of greatest shame and, and my point of greatest pain, that I can bring all of that into the circle and I will not be judged or put down for it. It doesn't mean that the other person agrees with me. It merely means they're willing to look past all of that and still see me and not put themselves in a superior position to me. Jesus was masterful at that. I woke up this morning at 10 minutes after 5 with something on my mind. I can only assume that God gave it to me in a sort of, I don't know, vision, whatever you want to call it. But while I was asleep, this is what God said to me. He said, I want you to tell the church that they are to be the face of my grace to the people in their world. Do you realize that before Jesus came, no one actually knew what God's grace looked like in action? No one had ever modeled it before. They may have talked about it, but no one had ever said, hey, this is what it looks like. And Jesus consistently over his ministry said, I've come to show you what God is like. I've come to be the face of God's grace to you. And Jesus says to his church today, be the face of my grace to the people around you. At church, outside of church, Don't have a different set of behaviors here than you have out there. Be the face of my grace. And we'll learn a lot more about grace, maybe not a whole lot more about grace today, a little bit, um, because we struggle with what grace is. We tend to vacillate between justice and leniency and think, well, leniency is grace and justice, well, that's justice. Um, And and actually, grace is something that, that actually brings those two together in the most beautiful way, without vacillation between one and the other. It actually incorporates both. And we're going to see that in a story in Jesus' life. But we're going to answer this question today. And that is, who belongs in the circle with Jesus? If you think of a circle of dialogue, who belongs in the dialogue with Jesus? And I just want to say this, whoever you think belongs in the dialogue with Jesus actually belongs in our church. Got it? I run into Christians all the time. They think, man, that guy needs the church. Okay. My question for you is, if he came to your church, would he actually feel like he belonged? Oh, no, he needs our church. He doesn't really belong there. I got a problem with that. Right? We all should. There ought to be this wonderful, and that's what I love about our church, this wonderful, inclusive attitude that says, you not only need us, and we not only need you, you belong here. Yes, yes. Now, thank you. Let's, let's see this in Jesus' life. So i got to tell you a little story first. A uh, little geography lesson. So the nation of Israel had three states. The bottom state was Judea, the middle state was Samaria, and the upper state was Galilee. The deal is the Jews, who primarily lived in Judea and Galilee, hated the Samaritans. And it's too long a story to get into here. I just want you to know they hated them. How badly did they hate them? Well, if you think of Judea as California, think of Samaria as Oregon, and you think of Galilee as Washington, if they went from California to Washington, say they were going to go from San Francisco to Seattle, you know what they would do? They would not drive, they would not jump on I-5 and just go straight up there. They, They would go straight east all the way into Nevada to some godforsaken highway that's hotter than blazes, and they would drive up Nevada, up into Idaho until they got to Interstate 90, and then they would go all the way west till they got to Seattle, and that way they never had to look at a Samaritan. That's some pretty serious hate, don't you think? And further, they were riding on horses and camels. If you ever wanted to take a straight line, I'm guessing it would be if you're on a horse. 
But that's how they did it. So now, Jesus said to his 12 closest followers, when they were in Judea, he says, we are going to Galilee. And they're going, oh man, that's so long. He said, I got good news. The good news is we're going to go straight there. That's not good news. <laughs> we're going to go through Samaria? Are you kidding me? She said, no, saddle up your horses. Here we go. So that's where we pick up the story. He, that is Jesus, came to a Samaritan, the Samaritan village of Sychar, near the field that Jacob gave to his son Joseph. And Jacob's well was there, and Jesus, tired from the long walk, sat wearily beside the well about noontime. Can you put some skin on that? Have you ever been hungry, tired, thirsty, and the middle of people you hate? He's had a good time to pick a conversation. That's when you want to say, you go sit by yourself, because this is not going to end well. That's where Jesus was, although he didn't hate the Samaritans. Everybody around him did. He didn't. So that's where Jesus is. Now notice what happens. Soon a Samaritan woman came to draw water, and Jesus said to her, please give me a drink. Now he was alone at that time because the disciples had left him to go to McDonald's. in town. Well, close, all right? <laughs> They had gone to the village to buy some food. And the woman was surprised, for she knew the Jews don't have anything to do with, with any of the Samaritans. So this woman has two or three things going against her. First of all, he's a male, she's a female. In that culture, men rarely spoke to women. Now she has another thing going against her. He's a Jewish man, and she's a Samaritan woman. So that's a lot of current going the wrong way. And when Jesus initiates a conversation with her and invites her into dialogue, she is shocked. And she says to Jesus, you're a Jew and I'm a Samaritan woman. Why are you asking me for a drink? I want you to see something. This woman, as she's walking up to the well, looks and she can absolutely, she's got her level meter going. And she realizes, whoa, this is not slanted toward me. This is slanted way away from me. He's a man. He's a Jew. I just got to get my water and get out. Because this is not going to go well. And Jesus levels the ground by saying, please give me a drink. He initiates the conversation. You know why? Because though she thinks that she's just going to get her water and go, he wants her to know, hey, I see you. And you matter to me. I don't see you for what you represent, a Samaritan woman. I see you. And I don't know her name, but let's just say it was Jody. He wanted her to know, I see you, Jody. After she says, I don't really belong in the dialogue, the circle of dialogue with you because you're a Jew and a man and I'm a woman and a Samaritan. Jesus says, if you only knew the gift God has for you, think with me for a minute. He's leveling the ground. He is saying to you, not only do I see you, I want you to know God has a gift for you. Now you know what she's thinking. I'm a Samaritan. I'm a Samaritan woman. And as the story unfolds, what else does she know about herself? She's been married five times and is just living with a guy. And she's thinking, oh my goodness, if you knew the truth about me, you would not be saying God has a gift for me. Jesus is undaunted. If you only knew the gift God has for you and who you're speaking to, you would ask me and I would give you living water. Those who drink the water I give will never be thirsty again. In fact, it becomes a fresh bubbling spring within them, giving them eternal life. Please, sir, the woman said, give me this water and I'll never be thirsty again. I won't have to come here and get water. You know what she's really saying? I don't belong in the dialogue with you. Just, just give me that water and I'll get out of your hair. I'll be out of your way. You won't have to mess with me again. And furthermore, I won't have to come back here. I kind of like that idea. But she's not going to enter into a dialogue with Jesus because she still doesn't feel like she belongs in the circle with Jesus. So Jesus realizes, I have to do something else. 
And he does something that I'm pretty sure none of us would do, which I just love about Jesus. So Jesus says, hey, go and get your husband. Oh boy, if you want to stop this woman in her tracks, you bring up that subject. This is her point of greatest pain. Anybody who's been married and divorced five times, is that a pleasant experience? I'm pretty sure that's not. She finally gave up on getting married, just lived with the guy. And Jesus says, go get your husband. Well, she, she doesn't want to dialogue about that subject at all because that's painful. So you know what she does? She shuts him down. Here she, here, look what she says. Oh, I don't have one. Now, give me my water and I'm out of here. She still doesn't think she belongs in the circle with Jesus. And particularly if, if Jesus knew the truth about her marital status. So what does Jesus say? You're right. You don't have a husband. For you've had five husbands and you aren't even married to the man you're living with now. Oh my gosh. If you think that she's going to enter in dialogue now, you're thinking, Jesus, you just shut her down. No, he didn't shut her down. Remember point number three about what a sense of belonging is? Read it out of your notes. What was point number three in a sense of belonging? I have to be free to be what? Fully me. All of my stuff. Not hiding any of it. So Jesus goes right to the very worst place in her life because you know what he wants to do? He knows he cannot dialogue with this woman until she knows that he is comfortable with the worst about her. Because only then can she feel safe. So he goes right to the worst thing about her life and puts it right out on the table. Now, she does what any self-respecting church member would do. Sir, you must be a prophet. Let's talk theology. Because I don't want to talk lifestyle, that's for sure. So she hauls out some nuance of theology. She says, I, I, I perceive you're a prophet, so tell me, why is it that the Jews insist that Jerusalem is the only place to worship while we Samaritans claim it's here at Mount Gerizim where our, worship, where our ancestors worshipped? So Jesus, I'd be a whole lot more comfortable in this dialogue if it wasn't about me, if it was about theology, or maybe about other people. I could do that. But once we start dialoguing about me, I get really uncomfortable. That's what she's actually saying. Now, I want you to see how Jesus responds to her. Jesus replied, believe me. What are the next two words? Would you read them out loud? Would you circle those, underline those, put stars around them, do whatever you need to do? Because that's huge. Right after revealing to her that he knows she's been married five times. And right after revealing to her that he knows that she's currently living with a guy that she's not actually married to. Right after revealing to her, I know your deepest, darkest, most shame-filled secret. I know it all, but you are dear to me. You're safe here with all your secrets, with, with all the garbage of your life. I'm not here to pounce on you. I'm not here to condemn you. I'm actually here to partner with you. And together, we can do something about that. Wow. He gives her a short answer to her theological question. He says, the time is coming and it, when it will no longer matter whether you worship the Father on this mountain or in Jerusalem. Indeed, he says, I want you to know it's here right now. That you can worship God anywhere if you're willing to engage with God in this concept of spirit and truth. Which probably were whole new concepts to her. We don't have the rest of the conversation that Jesus had with her, but it must have been stunning and it must have been wonderful because we're going to see what it actually does in her life. But uh, there's something that happens about that time. Just then, Jesus and the disciples, I'm sorry, Jesus' disciples came back from McDonald's. 
and they were shocked. They were shocked to see Jesus visiting with a woman, much less a Samaritan woman. And yet, they didn't have the nerve to ask him, what do you want with her? Or what are you ta- why are you talking to her? There's some, so much fun stuff in there. First of all, can you see that when it comes to helping people belong, the disciples are not really on that train yet? No, 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 no. This woman did not pass their gated community test. She was definitely on the outside and should not be included in the circle with Jesus because she just she failed on so many, so many levels. And they didn't even know she'd been married five times. All they had to know was she was a woman and a Samaritan, and she was on the outside of that gated community. But there's something else that's going on here which I, I love. These guys have been with Jesus long enough that none of them goes... Hey, what are you doing? Because they've done that a few times, and you always end up looking stupid and cold-hearted when you do that to Jesus, right? And so they were like, okay, been there, done that. I don't think I'll do that, right? So they just shut up. They don't go give the woman a hug or anything. They just stand over there in neutral land and go, well, I guess he's got that because we're not going over there. Yeah. Now notice the end result. The woman left her jar beside the well. Do you realize how important that is? Why did this woman come to the well? She was thirsty. And what did Jesus say to her? I've got a gift for you. And it will, it will create in you this living water and your thirst will actually change. And, and this water you're drawing from the well won't be nearly as important as the water you have on the inside of you. And she was already beginning to taste that water. She forgot she was thirsty. She leaves her, her, her jar right there beside the well. And you know what else she forgot? In this conversation with Jesus, where Jesus just outlined her deepest, darkest secret and her point of greatest shame, and he processes it with her and evidently tells her that God has an answer for that place in her life that, that no one could speak into. He says, God has an answer for you. She not only forgot she was thirsty, she forgot her shame. She left it with Jesus. She goes running back into town, telling everyone, this is a town that you know had ostracized her as that woman who's been married five times. It's not a big town. Everybody knows everybody's business in this town. She's been married five times. She's not even married to that guy. She forgets her shame even in the community. And she goes and she says, I want you to come and see a man. Now I want you to get this clearly. She did not say, I want you to come and see a man who gave me all the right theological answers to all of my questions. What does she say? I want you to come and see a man who told me everything I ever did. And He still called me dear woman. Yeah. She had that wonderful sense of being treated as a peer, of being seen, of being safe, to be everything that she was. And she knew that Jesus would partner with her. And so she said, could he possibly be whom? The Messiah. Because no human being would ever treat me like that. Powerful stuff. The sense of belonging and actually caring. So here's the answer. Who belongs in the circle with Jesus? People who want to engage with Jesus about their life. You know, (laughs) if this woman had said, you know some. There's three or four people in this town that I think are getting by with, with awful behavior. Would you partner with me and go help uh, bring them to justice? I'm pretty sure that conversation would have been a little different. It's why Jesus didn't ask her about anybody else's life. He asked her about her own life. So here's how this looks at New Life. I, I, I entitled this Jesus Model Church um, because it sort of is. So this is another story in Jesus' life. These stories are on virtually every page of his life. 
So I could have picked any of them. I just chose this story because I love the juxtaposition of these two people. So one of the Pharisees, now in order to know what a Pharisee was, a Pharisee was somebody in their country that would be revered sort of like Billy Graham or Mother Teresa, all right? And yet, uh, the Pharisee had some problems in his own life. So one of them, a Pharisee, he definitely had some problems with the way Jesus did ministry, but he wanted to engage with Jesus, so he invited Jesus to come have dinner at his house. That was huge. None of the other Pharisees were doing that. So Jesus said, hey, if you want to engage with me, I'll come to your house. So he invited Jesus to dinner with him. So Jesus went to his home, and he sat down to eat. Now, when a certain immoral woman from that city, I apologize, by the way, for picking two stories that have immoral women in, in them, all right? Just so you know, there were plenty of immoral men. By the way, in order to be an immoral woman, usually there's an immoral man involved in that. You got that figured out, right? Okay, just as long as we're clear. I also want to point out one other thing. The women actually came to Jesus. Where are the guys? So there might be something in there too. But anyway, so back on the story, all right? When a certain immoral woman from the city heard he was eating there, she brought a beautiful alabaster jar filled with expensive perfume. Then she knelt behind him at his feet, weeping. Her tears fell on his feet, and she wiped them off with her hair. How do you say awkward moment? That'd be pretty awkward. Now, he goes on to say, then she kept kissing his feet and putting the perfume on them. Now, don't read the rest of it. Look right at me. Because I want to tell you what most theologians and what most pastors would do. They would sit there and go, where did she get the money to buy that perfume? I think I know. She gets paid to do what she does. Would it be theologically acceptable for a woman who earns her money in prostitution to take the profits from her prostitution and buy perfume and anoint Jesus' feet with that tainted perfume? Hmm. That didn't seem to be on Jesus' radar. Did he know it? Yeah, sure, he did. But you know what he saw? He saw past what the woman had done. He saw past how she got the money for the perfume. And he saw her. Yeah. When the Pharisee who had invited him saw this, he said to himself, by the way, does the Pharisee have his level meter going? Yeah. Oh, yeah. So does the woman, right? Where does the woman go? She goes behind Jesus. She feels like, oh, the ground is not slanted in her favor. She knows who she is. She knows that Jesus is a prophet. She knows, probably Jesus knows who she is. And yet, somehow she knows that when sinners come in the presence of Jesus, the story always ends well. They get help. So she comes. She dares to come. The Pharisees got his level meter on, and he's thinking, sinful woman and me. Woo! <laughs> There's no doubt who's got the upper hand here. And he looks and he goes, ha, if Jesus was a prophet, he would know what kind of woman is touching him. She is a sinner. And I'm pretty sure the way he said that in his own mind was worse than how I just said it. Yeah. You know the great thing about Jesus, if you read the rest of this story? Jesus made both of those people feel equally welcome in his presence. The judging Pharisee and the sinful woman, they were both sinners, and they both needed Jesus. And he made them both feel equally welcome. So, at New Life, here's how it looks. If you want to get in the dialogue with Jesus, man, you are fully welcome here. No matter what you've done, no matter who you are, no matter what you look like, you belong here. Because if you belong in the presence of Jesus, you belong in our presence as well. Are you on board with that? Yes. Absolutely. Now, I want to close by teaching all of us one principle, because... 
All of this points to one truth that's absolutely life-transforming. Why is a sense of belonging really important anyway? Here's why. Belonging opens the door to vulnerability. And vulnerability opens the door to healing and change. I want to draw your attention, once you get the blanks filled in, I want to draw your attention to a commercial that aired a few years ago. And it was about a Holiday Inn Express. And if you remember those commercials, uh, people would say, well, I'm not really one of these, but I did stay in a Holiday Inn Express last night, and it made me feel smarter and better than I really am. So the the commercial opens up with an operating room and the patient is laying there but hasn't yet been put to sleep by the anesthesiologist and the the surgeon is just finishing his scrub and putting on his gloves. And he happens to mention to the the operating room nurse, uh, did I happen to mention I'm not a real surgeon? But I did stay at a Holiday Inn Express last night. Now, the response of the nurse is not nearly as funny as the response of the patient. That dude sits up, and he goes out of the room. You know why? I want you you to follow this, okay? One of the principles of, of belonging is safety. Where there's no safety, there's no sense of vulnerability. No one would be vulnerable. That guy's not going to be vulnerable to that guy who's not a surgeon and say, yeah, sure enough, cut me open. As long as you stay at a Holiday Inn Express, I think you probably got handled. No. Where there's no sense of safety and belonging, there can be no sense of vulnerability and trust. And where there is no trust and vulnerability, there can never be healing and change. It's why the most important thing that a church or any person, no matter who you're dealing with, the most important thing that you can communicate to people up front is that they belong. And that whatever their secret is, it's actually safe with you. Not that you're going to build a fence around that secret so no one else will ever know it. But actually, you're going to partner with them in the midst of that secret so that they can learn how to solve what that represents. So they don't feel judged and condemned. They feel partnered with. And as we as a church continue to to let people know you're safe here, no matter who you are, no matter what you've done, no matter what you look like. Just a couple of weeks ago, I watched our church in the most amazing way. And I've I've asked permission from the family to share this. I'm not going to name any names, but many of you will know exactly who I'm talking about. But I watched our church walk this out in the most wonderful way. When a kid who grew up in our church got arrested in our community in a very public way, and it made the news, and and it was just awful. And honestly, what he did was awful. Awful enough that he said to his family, I can never, ever again show my face in public. Yeah, that awful. At his arraignment, I watched nine people from our church walk into his arraignment to basically say to him, Don't give up on yourself because we're not giving up on you. Yeah. We will walk through this together. Your deepest, darkest, dirtiest secret that just got splashed all over the news, well, guess what? Even though we don't agree with what you did, We are willing to look past what you did and see you and walk with you and love you and care for you when the rest of the world wants you to rot in jail for the rest of your life. Yeah. We get to be the face of God's grace.
to everyone around us.